I want to welcome you to our Bible study tonight. It's Tuesday again, Tuesday Bible study night. Thank you for joining us today. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this privilege and opportunity to open up the scriptures and we ask you would inspire us by your presence, your word this day in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we're kind of continuing the lesson, <clears throat> pardon me, that we looked at last week from the book of First or Second Corinthians, pardon me. And just a brief reminder, in case you're joining us for the first time tonight, Paul was writing to the Corinthians a second time, at least as far as the books that we have in the Bible. The very first time, 1 Corinthians, that Paul tried to get in touch with them, it was because they were really acting in a greedy fashion that was not becoming of Christ. And so we have this love passage, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, which we read at all of our weddings, which quite frankly is not a love passage about weddings. It's about two people that are ready to kill each other, and Paul is trying to get them in shape and tell them that there's something more important to live for, and that's for love, and not for their greediness and so forth. Well, he was hoping to come, now that he's got this resolved, to get uh, them as far as their message in shape. And uh, Paul didn't have the opportunity to do that, so he wrote him a second book. He was disappointed that he couldn't get there. And at this point, the problem was is that they were somehow thinking that they're special. And this is kind of a problem with all Christians. Uh, oops, I can't even write special today. We're special. We're so special because God chose me. I'm special. You're not. I'm special. Therefore, I'm going to try to make you just like me. And this is kind of the problem. This is what happens with churches all across the country. We think we're special. And we are special, but not in the way that you think you're special. I'm special, so God has chosen me because God hasn't chosen you. Therefore, you need to be more like me. And so churches try to impose their systematic theologies, their way of behavior, their way of doing things upon everybody and say, you're wrong because you don't do it my way. That's not what it means. You're special because you've been chosen, that's true, but you're not special because you've been chosen because you're somehow special before God chose you. It's God's choosing of you that makes you something special, okay? And God chose you because God wants you to take the good news that you have received and give it to others. This is just the ongoing thing that's over and over and over again. If there's a theme that's in the Bible, this is it. We all think we're special because we've done something. God is trying to say, no, 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 you're, you're special because I've chosen you. Okay, we're special because God chose us. Not because we've done something. I wonder, this is really important to understand, because this is the crux of the matter at the book in, in 2 Corinthians. Paul wants to try to convince them that your job is not to make people like you to get to heaven, but to convince people that God has chosen them as well too, because God loves them. And so then we get to the lesson that we looked at last week. You might remember, let me put that in a different color, where he talked about us being jars of clay. We're easily broken. We're fragile. Again, it's not built upon us. We're jars of clay. We're fragile. But God uses us regardless. That's the amazing thing about God. God can use very fragile types of things and do some amazing things with them. Um, so it's God's choice of us that makes us special, not something that we have done. We, after all, are jars of clay. We're very fragile. And then Paul gets into, starts twisting his argument a little bit because Paul tends to ramble. And that's what we're going to see today. But it's kind of important to know that that's kind of the jump off point. You're a jar of clay. You're fragile. So don't make it about yourself, make it about Jesus. And that's the jump off point for today's lesson, because we just kind of continue this in our lectionary reading. So let me read to you this. 
So we are confident. So remember, you're a jar of clay. But, Paul says, don't let that fret. Because even though we're fragile, God has us in his care. Even if we crumble and get destroyed, or even God can, can put us back together, it's not about us. It's about the fact that God accepts us and loves us as we are. So, again, now he's transitioning to another argument. And so, <laughs> this, this word so, well, of course, it's a different word in Greek, but this indicates to us that Paul is changing the argument or moving it in a different direction now. He's dealt with that. There's an implication to this because it is, again, the specialness that's imposed upon us comes from God, not from something that we've done. Because after all, we're just fragile pots of jars of clay, easily broken. It's not about us. It's not about God. Therefore, here's what he takes out of this. Therefore, this is what you should know. So, because this is true, we are confident. Wait a minute. What? Put him a jar of clay. I'm confident in what? So, be confident. This is really important. Be confident in what? Be confident in God. Stop putting your confidence in yourself. Because you know what? You're going to fail yourself. You have failed yourself over and over and over and over again in life. And so if you make it about the jar, about you, and you're frail, and you break, you know, your confidence is shaken. It should be. You're putting it in a bad place. If you're putting your confidence in another person, same thing is going to happen. We put our confidence in God, and then all of a sudden, the creator of the universe, since God is the one in whom we find our confidence, gosh, here's the good news about this. The good news is, is my confidence is rightly placed and is secure and the one who created the universe. So I have confidence in God, not in the works of my own hands. So we are always confident, always confident. You can do something really dumb. Your pastor can do something really dumb. Your confidence should not be shaken. Your leaders can do something really dumb, and your confidence not be shaken because your confidence is in God, okay? Even though we know, so while we're, we're, we are always confident, even though we know that while we are home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So what is Paul trying to argue again? So we're confident in God. It's not in these frail pots of clay, these jars of clay. But while we're in these jars of clay, we still put our confidence in God. But you know what? While on this side of the, we're on this side of the kingdom. We yearn for that day where we can be face to face with God. That's what Paul is trying to say. So we're, we're confident. It's okay. We're frail. We may break. But our confidence is in God. It's not in this jar of clay. All right. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay. This is, you know, this is verse 7. I'm going to state something that may or may not offend some of you. So hear me out. I am almost get the Christian there. I am I call myself an agnostic Christian. <gasps> You're an agnostic? I'm a believer but I'm a believer, okay? What I mean by that is, I don't know whether there's a God. I walk as yet by faith, not by sight. I can't prove to you that there is a God. The most dangerous people in the world are people who say, I can prove that there's a God and I know that there's a God. They're scary because they're the people who want to impose their way upon everybody. I don't know that there's a God. I believe that there's a God. I walk, <coughs> pardon me, by faith, <clears throat> not by 
sight. I have compelling reasons for believing that there is a God. Okay? But I still don't know. I walk by faith, not by sight. This is what Paul is trying to say. And um, we go on. Yes, verse 8. Yes, Paul says, we have confidence that we'd rather be away from this body and at home with our Lord. So again, he's trying to, he's, he's talking about um, the transition he's making. is understanding that the materialistic properties of this universe is, is, is just a fraction of what truly exists. There's something that transcends this universe. And, you know, even, even people who don't believe in God understand, understand that there is something outside of this universe Outside of everything that exists, there's something transcendent outside of it because there's no way that everything contained in this universe could have just happened within the context of this universe. There's something that's transcendent, okay? So there's something beyond our materialistic properties, Paul is saying. We are not just flesh and blood, okay? It's, it's not just about salvation. You know, there are some liberal Christians in my denomination and our ELCA there are a lot of Christians who just are, you know, they'll throw out the phrase, well, you're so heavenly focused that you're not earthly minded, you know, and, and I get that. And we have to be f focused on both and, but sometimes in our ELCA, our, our, uh, some of our Christians can be so focused on the politics and the materialistic properties of this world that they've forgotten that there's a God that transcends as well, too. It's all about fixing the politics or fixing this. We can't get stuck on these materialistic properties of this universe. This is temporary. This is temporary. I may, if I'm fortunate, I might have 30, 40 years left. That's it. And then I'm gone. I'm two-thirds of the way done with my life. This materialistic body is not all that there is. And Paul is trying to remind us of that. To give us some hope. It's okay. This is not everything. God's got more in plan for us. We have confidence. Because we know to be away from this body is to be home with the Lord. Now, I can, I can tell you, uh, my dad was killed, I think, when he was 36 years of age. I, I've, I've outlived him by 20 plus years. Almost 25 years older than him. Almost. There's not, well, this is kind of hyperbole. I can't say that there's not a day that goes by I don't think about him. I'm sure there are many days that do. But I still wished I'd had the privilege and the opportunity of, of knowing him better. I will. Because to be absent from this body is to be with my Lord and to be with all those others who've entered in the church triumphant, to be with our Lord. And so there will be an opportunity for me to catch up. <laughs> and I hope for him to say, I'm proud of you. That would be nice. We have faith and confidence in God that there's something more that transcends the materialistic properties of these frail bodies. We put our trust in God. So again, Paul is making a transition from our witness to now the hope that we have in Christ. Going on. <clears throat> so whether we'd home or away <clears throat> from our bodies, we make it our aim to please God. So we might be physically disconnected from that, the one who transcends from God. However, we know sometime there's going to be a homecoming when we will have the privilege of being with God. And we just want to please God. We don't act the, uh, and, and behave well in order to get to heaven. We behave well because we've just been so blessed. 
We know God's got us under control, under his control, and it's all going to be okay. And so out of love and respect and care for God, we act in a manner that's, uh, uh, that uplifts God. See, again, remember what Paul's argument is? Sometimes we Christians make it about the pot of clay, the jar. We think we're chosen and special by God because that's why God chose us. But it's just the opposite. God chose us, and it's that which makes us special. Therefore, you can have confidence. All right, let's finish this up here. Whether at home or away from our bodies, we make it our aim to please God, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Um, okay, now, a lot of people will stop at this and fixate on this and say, see, some people are going to hell based on their good works. That's not what the point is. We have all done good and evil in this life. And so... We're going to see that in that judgment time, that we all failed God and we have succeeded. But remember, we come before God naked, with nothing to our names. And God sees our nakedness, and God clothes us. It is God that makes us worthy. So we go on. <clears throat> so you have to, again, not take this out of context. He says, from now on, therefore... We regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything new has become new. So we're not to view people through the lens of this materialistic property. We are to view them based upon the clothing placed upon them by God. You know, we're no longer materialistic beings. We're a brand new creation. God has redressed us. Actually, it's more than that. God has transformed us. So it's even more than just clothing. God has, has just transformed us completely. Now, we're still in this materialistic body. And we still fall short. But we need to see each other the way God sees us. God sees us. As a 10, we don't always act like a 10. We don't always behave that way. Sometimes you act like a zero. God still sees you as a 10. Because that's your potentiality. That's who God has made you to be. And so God sees you always as this. Oh, you failed. That's okay. But this is who you are. Stop fixating on this. We need to do the same thing for one another. Everybody that you see in life is a 10. They don't always act like a 10. Sometimes they act like a zero. But you treat them the way God treats you. As a 10 out of 10. Because that's who God has made you to be. Love it. So if anyone in Christ is new creation, the old has passed away, everything become new. Verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself. Remember, you didn't reconcile yourself to God. God did it. It's not your good works. Jesus, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, here's the punchline. God sees us as a 10 out of 10. God's purpose is to reconcile us. We are special because of God's choice. Now it is our job. He kind of loops it back around again. We are now the ambassadors of God's reconciliation in the world. You need to reconcile in the same way that God has reconciled you. So you see somebody who uh, is maybe in some trouble, done some really dumb things, and you just say, Oh, we start gossiping about that person. I can't believe it. Trust me, I do this too. Okay? We start gossiping about this person behind their back, and we start saying, I can't believe what this person did. I am not living up to Christ's expectations for me. Because I'm looking at the person like that person is a zero, and I'm 
acting like they're a zero, and I treat them like a zero, forgetting that God has treated me like a ten, and so I need to do the same thing for this person too. He may look like a zero, but that's not who he is. That's not who she is. They're a ten. And so our job is to reconcile them to Christ so they can start seeing themselves in this way. You know, probably one of the reasons why they act like a zero is because they don't believe they're anything more than a zero. We treat them like they're a ten. Treat them like they've been chosen by God. We reconcile them to God because we are now God's ambassadors of reconciliation. You see how Paul pulls this whole thing around again? We think we're special because we've done something special. No, you're special because God chose you. You're just a fragile pot of clay. God is, but God sees you as something more. God sees you as a 10. Therefore, God has now chosen you to be ambassadors of the same reconciliation. So that people see themselves as a zero will understand that they're actually a 10. <laughs> because that's the way God made them. All this is from God, verse 18, who reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. Since God is making his appeal to us, through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Wow, you are special. You're an ambassador of God's reconciliation. But you're not special because you've done something to earn it. You're special because God has chosen you and reconciled you. So as a reconciled person to Christ, as a person whom God sees as a 10, go and be an ambassador of this reconciliation today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who we see as zeros right now, the people that surround us that we just say, oh, I hate that person, I despise that person, I don't like that person, they're awful people. Well, that's not who you made them to be, you made them to be a 10. And so we're begging you, God, that you would help us to reconcile, be ambassadors of your reconciliation. For somebody did that for me, somebody did that for those people listening today. Let us do the same thing for others. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.